Howdy again, Mr. Pete here. Welcome back to the shop. And this is part three of a four-part video series. And it's number 872. I hope you have watched the first two. Here are some title blocks of the first two. And I'll put links down in the description if you want to go back and watch those. But in this third part, I am making this little bench vise. A project that I made in school hundreds of them over the years. However, mine that I'm making today will be made out of cast iron. These castings, again, came from Windy Hill Foundry, and I've already done several operations, so let's start where I left off the other day. In parts one and two, I faced off the castings, as you can see right here. I've drilled a series of holes. I have threaded this one, counterboard right here, and a few other things that you may have watched, I hope. So what am I going to do today? Let me start by drilling and tapping this hole, which is used to install the screw that will tighten this and hold it onto the bench while we are using the vise. So let's see how I'm going to do that. The first thing I want to do is lay the hole out and the thickness right here is one inch and 154 thousandths, so half of that is, well I've already got it set for the height gauge here, let me mark it, if I can get my arm out of the way. And with the little Lufkin square set at 5 eighths, I'll mark it right here. Center punch. And I'm ready to drill, and I will drill it 5 16 because I intend to tap it 3 8 16. Okay, let's center punch. Notice that I have the work held on an angle place, held with a Armstrong C clamp. Let's step over to the Delta drill press. I don't know why I keep name dropping. Okay, 5 16 drill. I'm about ready to tap this hole 3816 with a 3816 taper tap. Can you see that? Now, we've got about an inch here. That's way too much thread. It can be troublesome sometimes, and it does not increase the strength of the thread to make it real long. We only need a, a thread, threaded portion about 3 8 long, so I counter bore sometimes like that so that we are not tapping that much and it helps you to tap a straight hole. Now that's something that's hard to explain to the kids so I wouldn't even bother, but you can apply this to many things that you do in life. There's less chance of breaking a tap on a real long hole like this when you counter bore it. Again, absolutely no need to use oil or lubricants when you are tapping or drilling cast iron. It is self-lubricating. We've talked about that before. Oh, that taps nicely. This is wonderfully machinable cast iron. It's a pleasure. You can't hear it, but it makes almost a whisking sound as you tap. It's very pleasurable. Okay, next I'm going to make the screw right here. Now this is way longer than it needs to be because the bench itself that it is clamped to has a thickness of a one inch or more. So rather than give the kids a piece of 3 8 stock and a die and say go to it, I start with a bolt. Now why do I do that? Because even though they're using a die in a die stock like this, they will thread so crooked you cannot imagine. You have to be a teacher I guess to appreciate that. But anyway, I like to buy a box of bolts and these are 3 8 bolts, not hardened ones. Use a grade 5. And this is 3, this is 3 and a half. so I'm going to use this one and uh, I won't thread all the way. I'll, I'll mark it here and then I will be threading it with this. 
plenty of oil. Now, a bolt does not m cut that well. I don't know what kind of steel they use, but it is kind of troublesome with a die, but I'm going to do it anyway. Remember, these threads are not put on with a die. They are rolled on like this, that fast. So, I will put a thread on here about this long, because this will be cut off right here and the head thrown away. And then we have to drill and tap a hole right here for the swivel. So this little deal right here is actually kind of difficult. I wasn't going to include this because you know better, but I would have to make a big deal. All right, boys, over here. Everyone over to the table. I want to tell you something. When you use a die, make sure that you start on the side that is marked. Start from this side because it is tapered. It'll be very troublesome or impossible if you thread from this side. So keep that in mind the rest of your life. And I should also point out that some dies are not marked, so you just simply must examine them to see which side is tapered. Plenty of oil. Boy, that vice is loose. That die is dull. I'm going to put another die in and throw this one away. Okay, I brought out the heavy artillery. This is way too short. I get more leverage with this big one. And this is a high speed steel die where these little ones are carbon steel and they dull and wear rapidly. Now that's cutting. Big difference. Okay, that's enough. Okay, next we got to talk about the swivel right here. And there's lots of different ways of doing this, and none of them are easy, especially for beginners. But uh, here's how we're going to do it today. I would give the kids a piece of aluminum, probably better than steel, because they're going to have to cut this off on the hacksaw. Can you imagine how crooked it was? So then I got, got them to do it on the bandsaw. Well, let me show you really quickly. Uh -huh. And it doesn't have to be that accurate, and believe me, it wasn't that accurate when they got done. But let's take a look at how I would have them saw this off. You know, the ends were never square, so I would generally either do this for them or I had student assistants in there that would help me and help the rest of the class. But just put it on the sander. Now what I'm going to show you next is very difficult or impossible for a beginner student. We need to drill and tap a hole in this screw, a 1024 hole, to hold the flathead screw that will hold the swivel on. Well, I would need to buy taps by the gross. So I would have students help me, and here's a picture of me with one of my best students, and uh, he's about a foot taller than me, Troy Legner. He lives out. You, I've talked about him before, but he would come in. Oh, he spent half his day in the shop, and he would do anything for me. So I would ha have a whole box of these and have him drill and tap the holes. But I will show you real quickly how to do that. And it really needs to be done in a lathe. And these students were not ready to use the lathe. At the Atlas lathe, and I already had Troy, I mean, I already center drilled 
this off camera. This is a 5 30 seconds drill and I'll go in about three quarters of an inch. Okay. And now with a 1024 tap, see if I can fill the hole. And Troy did all of this for me. He only would break 10 taps per semester instead of 50. Thank you, Troy, for all you did for me to make my life easier when I was teaching, and I know you enjoyed it. And he had such a passion for machine shop. In fact, at that time, he thought shop was better than girls. Later on, I think he figured it out, though. And don't break the tap off when you hit the bottom of the hole. That's why I like to drill the holes extra deep. So you do not have to deal with that horrible blind hole. Okay, it's looking good. Now I'll stop working on this for a minute and we'll get back to the swivel. Now sometimes I would have Troy drill these on the lathe. Matter of fact, most of the time, but I did initially try to have the students do it. I know what you're thinking out there. You shouldn't do everything for them. Well, I wanted to show them how to find the center using a center finder, so I put a little die on there. Easy enough, but something they had never seen before, and maybe some of you haven't. But if you're doing it in the lathe, you don't need to find the center, do you? So I will step over to the lathe now and drill that hole 3 16 and then there are two ways of doing this. Originally, I counterboard all of them, and that's like a pan head screw. But I think that's just nonsense probably, and I'm going to use a 1024 flat head screw so it can just be countersunk. We don't have to worry about a counter bore. Back at the lathe, this is a 3 16 drill, and I have already center drilled it. I was shocked, and I do mean shocked, at how many people liked my video where I talked about countersink. So take a look at that. I'm telling you that because I will now countersink this just deep enough so that the flathead screw will be below the surface. And yes, it's below the surface. I'm not actually ready to install this in the hole yet because I want to take it apart several more times and the swivel would prevent that, but the whole idea here is that we want to use a screw of a, about the right length and I already fitted this up and if I tighten it down it, it just keeps the swivel from swiveling. No good. So there's a couple ways of doing that. One is to use Loctite but uh, if you know I was very hesitant to turn the kids loose with Loctite because it you know well you know what can happen. But another way would be to bugger up the end of the thread just a little bit in a vise. I know that is a crude method and the bubbas in my class that were told to do that you can't imagine how they would ruin the screw. I'd have to buy these six boxes of a 100. So anyway later on when I do put this together for the final time I'll put some Loctite on it or use the bubba method. It doesn't really matter. Now one other thing that I want to say here is that the original Stanley, remember this was made by Stanley Works, had a little handle right here. Well, that's one more rather difficult thing to make for the kids in the smaller diameters, so I am not going to do that in this video. I will be making this handle, which will be similar, so if you would want to make it this way, nobody's going to make this, but if you did, we would cut the head off with a hand hacksaw, drill a cross hole, and then fabricate this little handle. But when you fasten this onto a bench, you're really putting it on there for maybe for good or for months or for uh, a year or whatever. So we'll just use a wrench to, to fasten it. So I'm going to leave the hex head on there. 
which means that I probably could have used a slightly smaller bolt. But anyway, I'm done with this hole and this assembly for now anyway. Let's move on. Okay, the next thing I'm going to do is cut off a piece of half inch stock for the guide bar here. Five inches long I believe it is. I've already done that. And it will be held in with a roll pin, but as an alternate way you could use a set screw. Neither one is particularly easy for the kids, but here is the guide bar. And yeah, five inches is what I made it. This is plated because this is a piece of the horrible box store plated welding rod. I mean this is for welding and fabricating. It does not machine at all. I got this at an auction. Do not buy this stuff. You're going to hate it. It makes a great stake out in your garden, but not for machining. So so here it is, and I face the ends, or, or I should say the Troy did, and it fits nicely. So what I'm going to do now is drill that hole and uh, talk about these roll pins. So the first few years when I made these, I, I kind of copied off of Stanley without thinking about it. You know, that's the way they use an eighth inch roll pin, which means we had to drill it eighth inch, which means that I had to buy these by the gross. Yes, I would buy 10 or 12 packs of these eighth inch and then I still made a mistake and here they are jobbers lengths they would break those off like they were pretzels you know those stick pretzels so then I finally got the wise idea it took me a while I'm a slow learner I started using the machine screw size or length and I've talked a lot about these they are great and then I even bought some of the double ended ones you know when they break one end you flip them around so I did everything imaginable to <laughs> remedy the situation and see they'd break a drill bit off in here too so well, then they had a two dollar pin in there but anyway if they, if they drill an eighth inch I use these but finally I realized you fool have them drill it 3 16 and use 3 16 pins. You don't have to ream for these. These are spring pins, tension pins. I usually call them roll pins and it's one inch long. Wow, what a rant. I have laid out and then center punched where I'm going to drill the 3 16 hole. So putting the rod, the slide rod in there, I, I want it positioned so it's flush, not in not hanging out. Why do I tell you all these details? Because I've seen all of the failures that uh, my students made and they're beginners. I, that's expected. So notice how I'm holding this in the vise so it can't move. It's going to set down on the table so it won't swing like that. But I don't want it to work its way out as I'm drilling and it will happen. I've seen it happen. So I will take this big out of proportion <laughs> C-clamp and clamp it so I know it's an overkill for drilling a 3 16 hole but let's step over and do that. Okay off camera I drilled that hole and notice where it came out on this side so you got to be thinking about that ahead of time and that is why I am not in the center here I'm a little bit offset. Okay, now rather than drive the pin in there right now, and then these are kind of hard to get out. I mean, you can do it, but imagine a class doing that. So I'll just stick a screw in there for now, put a nut on it, and off camera, I punched a little mark right there, and I don't think you can even see the mark in the cast iron, but that is so that it is oriented correct when I take it out for whatever purpose because it probably won't work properly if I'm 180 degrees. you understand why? I hope so. Well that about wraps it up for part three. So really all I did here was to make this screw and the swivel and do a little threading there and drill a couple holes. So it, it doesn't look like I really did too much but it took a lot of time at least to explain it and I want you to watch Part 4 for the exciting conclusion as I make 
the screw, the sleeve, the handle, and then do the final assembly. So be sure and watch for that video when available. And this is Mr. Pete saying so long for now. Please give me a thumbs up and subscribe and ring that bell. It would really help my channel a lot. So long for now. Henry's Vice. Well, of all things, it's my new grandson, one-month-old Henry. How are you doing, Henry? Oh, Henry! You know, I want to raise this kid right, so I'm going to start him reading micrometers here very soon. Hi, hey, buddy. What does he weigh now, about eight pounds? Mm -hmm. He's eight pounds now.